um, just a little kind of, first off, welcome, and um, uh, uh, are you excited? <laughs> Yay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I am extremely excited. Um, at, at, yesterday was the, the kickstart of our Creativity Summit, and we had an event for um, adults, um, creativity in your life, and <clears throat> it was really, really amazing to see all these adults from um, retired seniors to post-grads really thinking about creativity in their life. And then following that, we had an imagination conversation last night where we um, had people from a variety of fields, people like Antoine Fisher, Althea Harper, um, uh, Chris Coburn from the Cleveland Clinics, uh, some really amazing people from the state of Ohio who represent the state talking about the role of imagination in the work they do, the importance of it, and then um, really talking about how that transfers to education and why imagination, the role of being able to conceive of something that is not, how important that is, and where is it cultivated clearly making a really, really great case for um, the role of art in our education system. So last night that was an event really for decision makers to begin thinking um, more about this idea of creativity, 21st century skills, all these buzzwords that are out there, but making it more tangible for them. Today though, this is the, um, this is the exciting day because um, we're with you. We're with you and we're um, thinking about what does the creative educator look like. I will say that <clears throat> your, your keynote today um, should get you started on a, a great, great foot. I'm going to do the introduction. I will warn you that um, I know this guy really well and um, I may get emotional, but uh, <laughs> I'll get through it because I've got some funny stories that will help me get through my introduction, which is actually short. but. Um, uh, but but I, I think it's really important. Um, today, our, your keynote is Dr. George Sakelli, and um, he is the uh, professor and area head at the University of Kentucky. Um, I, but first, I <laughs> do have a story to tell. Um, I was a student of Dr. Sakelli's, and when I was a... Um, <laughs> When I was, <laughs> he's going to help me through this. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. But I was a student of Dr. Sakelli's, and I'm going to tell my story is my first day of class. Uh, I had been studying museums. I was a studio minor. I was um, beginning to dabble my junior year in art education, and I knew I wanted to go there. And I ended up in this class, and the instructor was sitting under a table when I arrived. <laughs> and he invited us to join him under the tables. Well, if you remember being a junior in college, my first response was, oh no, he's going to want us to be engaged. And it was 8.30 <laughs> in the morning. But I, I, um, I got under that table, and I remember the discussion we had, because the discussion was, um, do you remember making forts as a child? And we spent the first half hour sharing our stories of fort making. And within probably a half hour, I knew those other students, I knew something about myself, and I knew where this class was going. And it was really beginning to get us to think about creativity, the essence of creativity, in a way that, um, it, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, um, so I just want to tell you that he is somebody who had a huge impact on me, but he's not just my mentor. I, I, I do want to tell you a little bit about who else he's impacted. Um, since 1969, Dr. Sakelli has pioneered creative principles and methodology in the field of art teaching. He is author and researcher. He's also won two of the most important awards in art education, the Manuel Bar Barkin Prize and the Victor Lowenfeld Award, major awards in our field. Um, Dr. Sakelli has authored 10 books and more than 100 journal and magazine articles. His contributions to teacher education are best exemplified by Adopt-A-School program, which I participated in and could tell you um, after we finished sitting under the tables, he let us know in about two more classes we would start teaching 
students. He pioneered a program where immediately, in my first art education class ever, we were going to be teaching. We were going to put our, what we were learning into practice. And it was called the Adopt-A-School Project, and now it's widely emulated. Um, he was the first, he's been one of the first to emphasize the importance of child's play and home art. The, what kids do at home, how when they're young and they're playing, how that if, reflects what should be happening in the art classroom. He also is and teaches the idea of an artist teacher. Um, he is an artist and teaching is an art. Um, and I think you'll see more of that today. Um, for his lifetime contributions to art education, Dr. Sakelli was named National Treasure by the National Art Education <coughs> Association. And um, see, I knew this would happen, but I, I, I wanted to do it anyway. So, um, <laughs> yes. And was presented with the honor of becoming a distinguished fellow. Now, here's something I'm going to, this is a little call to action for all of you. He was nominated um, for the presidency of NAEA. The vote is next month. Um, I would like to see him beat out the other guy who's from Michigan. <laughs> Can I count on you to get online and vote? <laughs> um, so um, please join me in welcoming my friend and mentor. You have no idea how proud I'm of Cindy. Uh, she's marvelous at every job that she has ever attempted. Thank you very much. I, I, sorry, I have this, but I don't trust this system, so I, I test my own. <clears throat> do, you hear, do you hear me back there? Do you hear me? <clears throat> that, I don't know. There's no response in the back, so I have to try, try the other. Do you, do you hear me back there? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, if, if that doesn't work, you have to raise your hand. I mean, <laughs> all right. Uh, one second, one second. Uh, Ilona, where, where is my speech? It's not funny. I don't have my speech. Um, uh, Mr. in the control booth, do you have my PowerPoint ready? No? Here comes the heart attack. <laughs> uh, art is not a lecture. We're good at a lot of things, but uh, we are um, not only not lecturers, but the kids hear so much of that all day, so when they come into the art room, they don't want to hear more lectures. Uh, planning an art lesson is not planning for a lecture. It's planning for a magical experience. It's planning for an art room that will inspire the children. It will be a magical space that can be anywhere, any place, and take them to the highest fantasies. It is um, best planned, actually, not by writing these lesson plans for administrators in little boxes, but planned uh, in... In terms of a drawing, I would strongly suggest that you sketch out, you draw, that's your media, not the little boxes, where was that little media in art school? Um, that you sketch out for, the, uh, for yourself. What is this lesson going to look like, sound like, feel like? What are the kids going to see when they enter the room? What's going to happen? What exciting thing is going to happen that takes place just here and nowhere else in the school? So uh, the art room, as I said, can be so many different places. And as Cindy mentioned, under the table, it can be a fort. Under the table, it can be a shopping center. The caves of Laskow, <laughs> which you enter. A hayride, if you close the sides of the, the art table. Uh, with infinite possibilities, just with the chairs and tables, what you can do. You don't need a Broadway show. Scenic design from a Broadway show. Um, you have wonderful elements right there. The 
art room and that I've been living in. And some kids really think that you live in the art room. One of the children said, I surprised to see me in the supermarket. He frankly thought I live in the art closet and, and just pop out at various <laughs> occasions. <laughs> um, when, before I came to America, I loved to read books about the ocean. And my parents, one of my favorite bets, some like giant stories, right? Stories of, I liked stories about the ocean. Of course, Hungary was landlocked. It was locked by the Russians, the, commun the communist army. And we could only dream. Dream you couldn't take away. So we dreamed about the ocean. And um, my dream was this wonderful picture books that, um, um, about the ocean. And wouldn't you know it when we came to America, the International Rescue Committee placed us right at Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. I was delighted. It was winter. Nobody on the beach. The ocean was mine. It was the most fantastic sight. We lived two, two blocks from the beach. And my friend Dennis and I, we couldn't communicate. I didn't speak English. I didn't speak Hungarian, certainly. We went to the beach every day. And we were there just with the guys with the little... Uh, metal detectors looking for coins. And uh, my first disappointment was it wasn't quite as blue as in the picture books. In fact, the uh, Atlantic Ocean was quite different. And uh, this happened to be right after a, a sanitation strike, which uh, <laughs> in the winter they figured, well, next year before the summer crowd will clean up. So, the ocean wasn't quite what it, what it was. It was more a little bit like this. So for the metal detector guys, they were a little upset, you know, because there were so many things that were in the way. But for us, for Dennis and I, no communication, no English. We were delighted. We went every day. We went every day to create, to find things on the beach. We didn't bring any art supplies, no need. It was right there, all around us. And we made the most wonderful things to float across the street, the, the uh, sea. We tried it out in the water. Uh, we worked on huge constructions on the sand. And even though now he's a big time in life photographer, whatever, but ever we talk, and uh, we still talk about this wonderful time we had at Brighton Beach. Our art class has many times been an art room. In fact, I'm known to travel with all kinds of things, and one of them is trying to get play pools on the plane, as my daughter, who is sitting here, will tell you. Not, not easy. Today, I'm sure it'll be even harder. But um, once you put a play pool in the art room, it is Brighton Beach. It is the ocean. And the just small props, it will help you be comfortable around the ocean. And you can see the wonderful, anybody collect children's towels? It's one of the great American art forms, you know, and you should, you should look for them each year. There are new ones every year. Uh, kids love designing and painting their own, and they also are double for magic carpets. So if your room is an airport, anybody's room is an airport, if you if you try if you're an airport, a little tower that you're building, and you need some magic carpets, a little wind behind it, maybe with a fan, and you have your magic carpets painted, you're ready to go. So your your art room can become this this wonderful magic carpet. We have had deep sea divers go underwater in our play pools. Um, Anything that you can possibly imagine. I remember the opening. Do you remember the opening of the English, uh, the, the uh, channel? It's called the, the, uh, the long tunnel between France and England when they opened this. Well, one of the children replayed it. He somehow saw it on the news and replayed it, creating out of the pipes and, and uh, they constructed it in the play pool and uh, had his little toy cars crossing the English channel. So you're creating this incredible environment. You see, uh, creativity is not something that uh, you can mandate. We have students, I go to student teachers, and I see on the board, very well-meaning, uh, smile, you know, have a good day, be creative, you know. 
uh, don't know if we can mandate such things. Uh, it is more an invitation, an appetizer. You're creating a set, a scene, where you can leave school and go to the beach, where you can be somewhere else and not worry about taking tests or be concerned about the, the everyday life situation. So you're, they're entering this new space, and it's a time capsule, and we have the possibility of, of going not into the pool, but even under the floor. The little kids are very funny. They're checking under the floor because one of them mentioned that there was actually water underneath the floor and that it's sure that Jacques Cousteau was somewhere swimming under the... And then we can look at the stars. We can look at the... I'm fortunate to have a window in school, which look at the stars with the telescopes they built. And so it's, it's, you're inviting them into this situation. And it's, it's not a matter of, of saying, well, this is what you're going to do today. This is how you're going to do it. This is how I'm going to test you. But a matter of bringing them into the situation, an incredible appetizer for fantasy and play. And once that takes over, then the kids, for every, every pool and for every magic carpet, they will have a million ideas. And then you have separated the art lesson, what you thought of, what you thought of as, as the lesson, into actually what the artist, and there are many artists in your class, will take that lesson and, and of course, uh, expand it into just unimaginable directions. And look, we're not paid that well, you know that. So what is the fun of art teaching? Going in there, giving you a lesson, and everybody being your helper, everybody being in your assistant and making that lesson that you've created? Or is it really the fun and the excitement of seeing all these different things happen in class? When we put a play pool out, when we start uh, talking about the beach, the kids chime in with their own stories, with their pool stories, with their um, uh, stories about building in the sand. By the way, this is great for sand playing. If you are reluctant to play sand inside, in the in your classroom, this is just wonderful. And you can go excavating and have a treasure hunt. You can, you can be an archaeologist. It's, it's, it's used for, we use it for all kinds of things. But it also, it's a nice birthday cake and a space capsule. Don't mention it to anyone. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> lots of the kids will find so many uses for, for the pool. Um, so when you have this environment, there is instantly this feeling of freedom and openness. This teacher, we can trust. This, this teacher is okay. We can play in this room. We can be ourselves. Um, everything we do takes place on the floor because that's the kid's play space. The scary space is at the desk. There are tests there. Oh, boy, you don't know what's going to happen at the desk. You don't want to take a chance. Get them off the desk. That's my first instruction from all my students, um, my, my uh, college students. Get the kids off the desk. Let's under it, fine. <laughs> okay, next to it, you know, whatever, uh, but um, get them off the desk, get them on the floor. Entirely different relationship happens when you're on the floor playing with kids. If you never played on the floor with children, uh, it'll open a completely new world. Uh, it, you, you really have not made art with kids. You know, this, it, it breaks down completely this, this school teacher and, and student relationship. It, it becomes an artist to artist, a colleague to colleague feeling. Um, it's an entirely different uh, sense of, of being with kids. So spend a lot of time on the floor with the kids. And um, use your imagination uh, to create these appetizers, these beginnings. Bring in a tent and see what happens. All of a sudden, people are going camping. There's somebody who just made the most incredible fishing pole. Wow, you know, we're going fishing. And uh, objects that are not expected in the school. Uh, so a bicycle, okay? And uh, that was recently. I'm thinking about this past week. Uh, uh, somebody bought in a bike in school. Uh, the, the kids decked it out. It was the most incredible bike with all kinds of... So unexpected objects. We had visitors from snakes in school. I don't recommend that. <laughs> but uh, to, so uh, make the school this this uh, make the art room always think of this is the the school 
what they do, how they do it, how they approach it, and then don't do it. Do it differently, okay? <laughs> everything, everything. That's how you test that you're in an art room. And you can go down the line. You, know? you take 15 minutes for attendance. By that time, when is the teacher going to stop talking? I want, I'm in here. I just want to make art. And she's still taking attendance. You know? They got lost from one side of the hallway to the other. So you need to take attendance, right? And it has to take the most precious beginning, peri- beginning of the period. So enter... When they enter, and even the doorway can be a very interesting. Uh, our doorways can be turnstiles. It can be a, a little hole, and opening, a peephole, like a construction site that, people, that uh, kids can look through and wonder what's happening inside. It can be a magic carpet, and we're waiting for the arrival of the king and queen, and you have the throne ready. So you have just small things in the room. Kids driving chairs. Kids driving chairs in your room. They use pot covers. They use um, hula hoops. They're driving around the room in their chairs. They put a balloon on it. Oh, it's different. It's a hot air balloon, right? It's going in a balloon ride. They tilt it in a different way. It becomes a snowmobile. Put two of them together. It becomes all of a sudden a, 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 runer, a lunar explorer. Uh, so every piece of furniture has a million lives in the classroom. And again, with, with small changes... A few additional props that should not be in school, okay, like the bicycle or the snake or, forget the snake again, or this, or a play pool and, and many other things, just small things in the classroom will create the sense of excitement and the kids will be uh, ready to, uh, to play. Um, let me go over here for a minute. Uh, we also uh, do a lot of performing. Uh, performing, again, uh, you're out of your seat, you're on the floor, great. But kids are ex- very good performers, very exciting performers. And uh, we use all their performance skills, their sound effects making skills, put it ventriloquism, a child doing ventriloquism, it's the most hilarious. A child doing a magic act, have you seen that? Wow. And they use their own stuffed animals instead of a live bunny. Um, great performance possibilities. I grew up before television, so for, for us, um, every home, every home in, in Budapest, in Hungary, had every child had a puppet stage. So we were always performing. And when I came to America, we found our first television set. We had the television set, but it was on the sidewalk. It happened to be empty. <laughs> Took three of us, three of my friends, to bring it upstairs. And we went inside the television because it became our performing stage. And it was an old Dumont. Anybody remember the Dumonts? It had a big open door. Do you? It had a big open door. So we can open. We had somebody just opening our stage. And we were inside the TV set and doing this. So lots of performing. And it's a wonderful way for kids to share their artwork. You know, it's the... Small props, again, to change the, the scene and setting, and uh, just a hat. My head has grown. What does it? Maybe your introduction, you see it, it made my head. Okay, good. <laughs> to watch that. <laughs> uh, and, and just the... And, and bring the excitement to the rest of the school. I know the teachers get annoyed when we drum down the hallway, but... Uh, <laughs> They need to also get up and look, and then the, the kids have this. Now, the, the, this may, may be a little hard to. You want to see me drum and pull the toys? Some of my colleagues call me the toy maker. And we do make a lot of toys. Um, we uh, make a lot of toys for many reasons. One of the reasons being that uh, instead of taking home art that uh, is for the refrigerator and it's mostly disposable, not by the children, but somehow, I don't know how that happens. It must be a tooth fairy that takes those drawings off the refrigerator and gets to the next one, they fill them out. Uh, so we make art to last. We make art that's playable. And everything the kids take home, if we make a playhouse, 
Uh, the kids make a toy bed, for example. Not only is that an introduction to industrial design, interior design, toy design, and all the art professions, but it, it's also something that they can take home from school and continue enjoying and playing with. There's a better chance, and I'm always concerned, a better chance that it won't up, end up just in the trash. And there's a better chance that they'll continue not only playing, but adding to it. And if they have the beginning of this uh, train layout that they're making, well, they may be building other things for their train sets. Art, the small part of art takes place in school, a very small part of art takes place in school. I'm more concerned about art that takes place also at home and just as concerned what happens before class. I know that you're all well prepared when you come to class, but your students need to be just as well prepared as you are, just as excited about the lesson as you are. They shouldn't come into the class and ask, look at the board and say, well, what are, what are we doing today? What, what, what's up your sleeve? What, what, you know. Dear artist, meaning the teacher, what are you having us do today? That's not the way artists work. Artists work with their own ideas. So the kids need to come in having investigated, looked for, um, keeping this, if you keep sketchbook, there's no reason why they can't. Uh, there's no reason why they can't share their ideas as they come into class. And instead of the 15 minute attendance, it's their turn. That's prime time, the beginning of class. You all know that from education classes. The prime time, who's on prime time? Not always the teacher. It's the children who share these incredible ideas. So it's great ideas that you're looking for. And by surprising them each time that they come in with a lesson, I am not sure if that's a diet that will continue and will help them in graduate school when, when students still come to me. Here is the form, independent study. Finally, I took 190 million credits. Dr. Sikeli, what do I do now? What do you want me to do? That's not going to work. So the notion of um, the kids being prepared for class, and you know what's going, you know, you can have them do all kinds of preparation for class, so they come in with the same excitement as you do, and they're ready to share the excitement, and they're ready to act on that excitement. So that's one reason for... Uh, for uh, making these toys. The other reason is uh, the introduction to history. I don't know about you, but I used to sleep through, and I had some of the finest art history teachers, but it was my snooze. It was my break to, to take my nap. The light went out, I went out. So, <laughs> it's unfortunate, because now that I think of Dory Ashton and some of the fine people, but I should have. Terrible confession. Uh, <laughs> But in terms of art history for children, uh, it's extremely important for kids to understand that they are artists, that they are making art. And the, the notion that um, the art history can be in toys, it can be in cereal box prices, it can be in all the things that they collect. Everything that children collect has a wonderful history. Children came, come into your room, and look at this new pencil um, sharpener. Well, if you look at the history, and I collect these books now and everything, and I encourage you to collect as well. It's very exciting, is sharing your collection. There are great, there's a great history of lunch boxes, of pencil sharpeners, of erasers, of cereal boxes, anything you want. Um, that art history will have the kids excited about beautiful things. Isn't art history about getting excited about beautiful objects? and not memorizing the feet of the, you know, the, the test I remember and when I finally woke up in art history class, they showed you a slide of the toes of one of the uh, Greek statues and you're supposed to, manicures weren't that great in those days, but you're supposed to re remember the toes of the Greek and that was your great love for art history. So before you get into art history, it's the love for beautiful objects and for collecting beautiful objects Nobody wants the kids' collections, right? Who wants it? You know, it's, they come to you, oh, it's such a nice... Helps me when we go to McDonald's, cleans up everything after him. Look, look at it. He's smiling. He's right, right? But, but you, oh, gosh. She wants to take everything home. I mean, she wants to take all those. 
Well, McDonald's happens to be, or, or Starbucks happens to be, one of the most advanced art supply stores. And the children recognize that. They want to take it home. But where are they going to take it? Who welcomes that stuff? So there are the, all these come into toys. We go to McDonald's. We go to my oldest students, for example. We sat at Starbucks making toys. It's wonderful toys, just from what is around the Starbucks. Um, so toy making, the history of art taught through toys, American pool toys. If you look at the history of Lionel, Fisher Price, Marx, and um, a number of others, um, uh, Swin, uh, Schwinn bicycles. What great! Now museums are beginning to recognize this. The biggest show in the, the most attendance was at the history in history of museums was at the Met. Was a baseball card show years ago. <laughs> no. Baseball cards, art forms. Uh, the early baseball cards, the, the tobacco cards, were great drawings, wonderful prints, and uh, certainly a, an introduction to beautiful portraits, which in turn will later on perhaps lead to other portrait appreciation. So you want the kids to, to be interested in art history, but in terms of loving beautiful objects, collecting beautiful objects, whether they found objects, or um, um, objects that uh, of have some uh, historic interest. So think about all the things that kids collect and look at the history of them. This week, for example, we're looking at, in my class, uh, we're looking at Lionel trains, and there's an old train store in Lexington. And we just went to the train store to look at the layout that this uh, store owner has. And uh, so, this, this, is, this is something that... The other thing is you want to play with them. I mentioned getting on the floor with kids. I spend most of my time... This is the only time I wear these black pants. It's always jeans. I sit on the floor all the time with kids. And um, we play. We play. And every art lesson that you teach, any art lesson that you teach, can start with a preliminary play. Make your art lesson... Tell me what the art lesson is. What preliminary play can you... Now, the preliminary play is rehearsal, but, but artists rehearse. Who, you know, pianists, dancers, of course, hours of rehearsal. Artists, you have it, you don't. You're not talented, you know, forget it. You know yourself as artists how many hours you, know, you spend and the rehearsals in your, in your uh, work is, is extremely important. The warm-up. We had these nice little shoes. I remember when I went to school in Vienna, we had these little red slippers, boys and girls, little red slippers. And we did these physical exercises to warm up before we made art. You need rehearsal before art. You can't come. You can't tell me that you're coming from a, from a, a science test and you're going into art and you're just going to say, okay, well, let's be creative. Let's make art now. God, you know, your head isn't there, and you, you know, that's about the last thing you want to do, especially if you didn't do so well on that test. You know, that's not something you want to... So you've, it's very important to rehearse, to get in the mood, to get ideas. How important is it to you as an artist to get ideas, to find ideas? By substituting, giving ideas to the kids, you're not doing them a favor. Remember my graduate student. You're not doing them a favor. So looking for ideas and then rehearsing, playing, them with, playing with them on the floor. Uh, you have two champions here that you didn't recognize. I have two trophies, only two trophies I ever earned in my life. Okay? But they were both for playing marbles. And Hungary at that time was very big on marble playing. So I told the story to the kids. I showed them my trophy. And you want to show the kids more than just your teacher self. You want to show them the story of, you know, you're a very special person in their life. You're not like other teachers. Don't try to fit in. That's the biggest mistake. Don't try to fit in. All the things that you love, that you see, that you collect, that you're interested in, is not what the other teachers are. This is something that you need to bring to the kids. So open up to them. Tell them about Dennis. Tell them about your days at Brighton Beach. And uh, marble playing is, is something that we used to love to do. And uh, so when I um, uh, collected, and actually I got it at, at Goodwill, my favorite shopping place. Anybody like Goodwill? 
Okay. Oh, good. You're my friends. <laughs> okay. Uh, so <laughs> when, you co when I collected a whole bunch of this from Goodwill, uh, just putting them on the floor, getting on the floor. By the way, the art room needs to be the good shopping site, the, perhaps the best shopping site in the world. You don't want to be condemned on this hoarding show and be televised, <laughs> but you need an exciting shopping site, not that you just contribute to, but that welcomes the children's contributions as well. And they need to be, need to be a system where it's not put in front of them. Look at this art teacher. She's all, everything, they, everything they need right on the desk. How can you possibly predict what an artist will need? How? I was so impressed. In first year of art school, we got a list of supplies. The teacher said, it's, all, it's downstairs. Don't worry. Go downstairs to the supply store. They have everything for you. I said, this, this is really a great school. They, I just got here. They already know what I want to paint. They already know what I want to do. I mean, all I have to do, this is going to be easy. <laughs> but it's not ridiculous. So the kids need to find their own supplies. In the supplies are ideas and possibilities. You can't possibly hand them the things. Uh, so the art room needs to be set up as the most magical shopping site with all kinds of boxes and containers, things to look into. Uh, my daughter is 20, my uh, youngest daughter is 25, and she still comes home and wants to look through my wallet. Not for the credit card, I know what you're thinking. But she still likes to look through her mom's pocketbook and wallet and, and look through my pocket and think. This is what kids enjoy. They, they like to search for supplies. So give them the opportunity and, and uh, it's also getting them out of their seats and looking for the things that they need specifically for their project because they're the artists. Okay. Um, so playing, playing with them um, and uh, you will be very interested. I, would, I wish I could uh, share with you, but all the marble games the kids came up with. Do you remember Pogs? Pogs, anybody? Anybody old enough to? You don't have to admit, but it's Pogs. Uh, well, if you remember Pogs, they're really not very good games for Pogs. Nice, the little disc, they were, they were uh, cardboard discs, nice discs, but the game, nothing. Um, so besides marble games, I remember the Pog games that the kids invented right inside these uh, uh, circular um, uh, hoops. Um, so lots of possibilities uh, of inventing games, and of course, art if you speak to them about art, it's, we're inventors. And um, as we create these plays, we're always inventing new things. Uh, the themes that we played inside this hula hoops are just so many, I wish I could tell you all of them, but um, it's, it's really just playing with the kids. You know, playing with the kids uh, on the floor and uh, having fun with them and taking their clues. Now, the if you want to go into artworks that are paintings, drawings, and other things, yes. You just uh, cover the floor with white paper and underneath the hoops and underneath all the wonderful marble games or, or pogs, they can, you know, they can work towards drawings or a board or a playboard. I mean, it can move towards that direction if you like. But first you have to have some idea of what you want to do. Uh, the circus is, is certainly one of our um, performances that the children love because uh, I invite them uh, to bring in their things that they, uh, most schools will say no. I remember driving my kids around Montessori and, you know, by the time we got this a circular drive, by the time they got to the end, you know, they had to leave everything in the car and I had to keep reminding them. So all the things that there was dear, important to them, stayed in the car. They went into school, they were dreaming about it, thinking about it. Could have made great artworks with it, but no, it stayed in my back seat. Uh, so the notion of bringing things in that are of importance to you, and the kids love bringing their teddy bears. The best fashion show is the fashion show which dresses your own teddy bear or your own stuffed animal. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the most beautiful, I only have one drawing, I must tell you one drawing that I have in my office. And it's, it's a drawing of a teddy bear that was made by one of my uh, daughter. And it's the most beautiful drawing. 
Because art is not a series of exercises leading to somewhere that we imagine. Art is real. Every artwork is important to the artist, but we don't treat the kids the same way. It is important to them. They have to have some investment in the artwork. And that teddy bear has lots of investment. Ilona, I remember drawing her first violin. That was a momentous occasion in her life. And that drawing really is, 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 is in that. And the drawing is part of that momentous occasion. So it's not art exercises. It's, it's really meaningful artwork in each case. Um, and when they bring in their teddy bears and we perform it, oh, excuse me, I'm being interrupted. Uh-oh, uh-oh, the stars of my circus, there's something wrong. Oh boy, oh boy. Bear with me, okay, I'm sorry. Oh boy, hmm. Uh, I think... Oh, labor pains, labor pain. oh gosh. Oh. Anybody ever watch for Lamar's? No? Oh, okay. It's, it's very painful. Just look away, look away, look away. Oh, ah, oh, look. Okay. So now we have two performers for our circus. Lo lovely, lovely pair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You want to do, f can you hear me? Oh, good. I just don't. Uh, okay. You want to do funny things. You want to do silly things. You want to do crazy things. You want to exaggerate. You want to do things in, in the art class that are surprising. The birth of, you know, not only timing is important in your art class, but also to bring in interesting surprises. And they're all kind. The mailman is coming now, and somebody knocking on your door, delivering a secret file. Uh, we have cell phones now, so you can have someone calling on the cell phone. And they, there are lots of fun surprises which can be part of the, uh, the art room, which will lead, lead again to creative ideas. And that's what we want to, to uh, have the kids uh, act on. Yeah, we're going to have okay. to put it back on. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, let me continue on. Now, it's about trusting the children, and the children may be I teach kindergarten, I teach college, but trusting all of them. And that's one thing that it, you need to do. And a good art teacher is, as you are, you need to trust the kids. They can't do this, they can't do that. They're supposed to be able to, they can't. Trust the kids. They will come up with great ideas. They'll come up with the best ideas. If you create the circumstance for it, they will come up with the best. Oh, no, no, I have, to have a, I have to have a clever art lesson. Otherwise, nothing will happen. No, 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 no. Trust the kids. They will come up with uh, wonderful ideas. And you can uh, use the environment. You can use lighting in the room. There may be birds. Do you hear them? Spring birds in the winter singing, and you can have sound effects. Um, all kinds of possibilities where you... Uh, create this uh, interesting situation in your art room, and the kids will come to it with all kinds of stories, with all kinds of surprises. And only in the art room is there time to listen. Who listens to kids anymore? Do parents have time? Do we have time on the testing in every other subject? It's only you. You're the special people in the children's lives. You're the only, the last people who have time to listen to kids. So spend time to listen to their ideas. I don't have to tell you how important idea is in today's art world. But in every art world, the, any artwork is based on ideas. So the patience of trusting the kids, listening to their ideas, and responding to their ideas, encouraging those ideas, that is not only a better way of art teaching, there are many good ways of art teaching.
but it's a more rewarding way of art teaching because you go into art teaching as an artist that you want to also learn from the kids. Otherwise, my friends used to say in art school, you're going to art teaching, what are you, crazy? I, I'd rather drive a cab. <laughs> now, some are in the Met, some are, most of them are driving cabs. But watch what my reward has been in my 40 lots of years of teaching life is to see great art that is inspired, that not I made up, I brought as this clever art lesson, but every minute I am seeing uh, like Picasso going to, to Africa or Matisse going to the Orient and seeing, uh, discovering great art every day, right in your classroom. How that nourishes your art is just amazing. It's better than a paycheck. So unless you allow that to happen, uh, it's, it's, the teaching life can be a short, uh, a very long trip towards retirement when teachers tell me, well, when I get to that stage, when I get older, I'm going to start painting again. Well, that's very nice. But during the time that you're with the children, you're seeing the most wonderful ideas all the time. Okay, I, I brought my train tunnels to show you just another possibility of playing with them on the floor. We set up train sets on the floor. We set up islands on the floor. Islands are simply a big torn sheet of paper. Well, how are you going to get to the other island? Oh, the, the kids are thinking and they're building things. The other island, another brown sheet of pa torn paper. Oh, maybe we'll take a raft. Maybe we'll take this... this um, um, a flying device, and they'll come up with all kinds of things. Um, so the floor and the playing with them is all kinds of possibilities. We have ice today in the classroom. Ice in the classroom? We have a very expensive classroom. We can make ice in the classroom. It's just a silver, uh, a, um, a, a large um, piece of plastic, but the kids come up with all kinds of way of crossing the ice. Be careful now, okay? This is not an easy task to cross the ice. So they come up with all kinds of... So the possibilities that um, the floor playing will allow for, if you see the art room, look at your art room as your canvas. Your art room is your canvas. Every part of that art room is your canvas. And how can you use every part of the art room? Every part of the art room is also full, filled with, with uh, possibilities for these simple props. So between, the, two, between the, the props and the canvases, these multidimensional canvases, you have incredible possibilities. I cannot uh, uh, emphasize enough the idea of collecting and being a collector. The children are, of course, collectors, but as soon as they get old enough, the room gets to be cleared out. You're too old to, do, to have all this junk in your room. Children's rooms are their studios. The only studio that stays and lingers a little longer is the bathtub. There they can close the shower door and create. I have a student who did a whole master's thesis on the artwork kids do in the bathtub. That's still, but their rooms, they get cleaned out, that's it. You know, very fast clean out and becomes a home office. Okay. So if, what would you do if your studio became a home office and nobody asked you about it? You were in school one day, came home, my studio, all of a sudden, home office. Well, uh, so the, the idea of, of, of collecting um, and having a room for collections. Now, if they don't have it at home, the art room needs to be a play. Not only to put uh, works on the bulletin board or on, around the art, but the kids' collections to have a home for it, uh, to design uh, um, exchanges and ideas for using their collections. They're not only collections, but their collections come with ideas. It's part of the deal. So when they show you your, their collections, and kids can each take turns bringing their collections, 
They have a million ideas of how to use those collections, what they, can, what they want to do with it, even if it's a cabinet, a secret compartment, whatever, to make with that um, uh, cabinet, with, that, with the collections. Uh, art teaching, as I said in the beginning, is not preparing a lecture, but being an artist by example. And I always thought, well, that's easy. When I finished art school, it's easy. I'll just bring my easel into the, I was a painting major, bring my easel into the art class. The kids will be so well behaved. I can just paint while they painting. And that lasted 45 seconds. <laughs> but you're, an art, you're, you're a model in every way. You're a creative model in every way. Uh, the way you dress, the, the art teacher's keychain, the... the uh, um, the hall pass that they, they take to uh, this, you know, my, my ki- I didn't understand the first time I was teaching, the first year, because my kids went to the bathroom. I thought, boy, there's a real problem here. The doctor needs to. My kids were going to the bathroom every second. Well, <laughs> they just wanted to show the art pass to other kids, you know. That, uh, but there, there are so many ways that you influence them that not necessarily standing in front of them and painting. But your creative nature, the, the creative things that um, you bring in, including your own artwork. There are so many art teachers that don't bring their artwork to class. The kids never see their artwork. How many art teachers that you had in college did you see their artwork unless you worked in one studio, in one building? Um, did, they, did you see their home studios? Very seldom. It, I was 25 years old, I think, the first time I went to see my painting teacher's studio. And he was the only one in art school that let us come to their studio. So the, you're, you're teaching everything about yourself. Your material is not what the Board of Education gives you. You're the material. And you don't have to feel that you're unprepared coming to class because you don't have those things blocked out for every five minutes or that you don't have a clever lesson that everybody will simply follow because you're a gem. You're walking in with incredible experiences and wonderful stories, wonderful observations. And that's your art teaching. And many of you are collecting very interesting things. I have a, a student in my class this semester who collects ceramic, I'm not supposed to tell you, but ceramic skunks. Not one I would choose as my collection, but they're interesting. They're very interesting. And while I wasn't too crazy, the kids went, they loved it. On the other hand, kids will constantly bring in collection that we need to take seriously. So it's an exchange, an art class is a place where artists get together, artists of all ages get together. It's not a place like other classes where there is only one teacher and the rest are students. Don't look at your kids as students. Look at them as children. Look at them as artists. Look at them as colleagues. Talk to them as colleagues. And the response will be tremendous. So... In terms of collecting, I thought I would share with you just a a brief... Do we still have time? Okay. Um, Just a brief example of some of my most recent collections. By the way, I will be featured on one of those hoarding shows. But uh, the difference is I mentioned to someone in the back... Hi. I mentioned to someone in the back that when I collect, I keep them... I have all my children's birthday parties by year. So all the things, all the, the, the wonderful packaging, the wrappings, the, all the things that are thrown out, they just want to get to the, pri- the prize. Then the napkins, the, the plates, those are wonderful artworks going back to the 50s. Um, and now I'm filling in those collections. I have it very neatly organized. So um, kids want uh, their favorite subject. What is more important than birthday parties, right? Uh, so, uh, we have a birthday party twice a week in class. We have tea parties, we have birthday parties, so we play together. And when we, we have tea together, we also talk about art together. When we have a birthday party, it's a uh, birthday party that kids never have. Kids have the most bo- boring birthday parties today at the skating ring. It's all, you know, the next party's coming in, they don't know the kid's name, they lost the, the order for the cake. And then kids, but they spend a year thinking about their birthdays, and what do they get? Oh, my God. So, 
play out their dreams that are not <laughs> happening anywhere else in society. And, uh, you know, create these things. At the same time, look at the history. This is art history. You know, but not the one I fell asleep through. This is art history where you're looking at children's birthday plates. One of the most interesting art forms is birthday cards from the 1940s and 50s. That was the heyday of, of illustration for children's birthday parties. Children's napkins from that period as well. So this is the art history that you can also convey while you're having the most amazing birthday party for all their invited teddy bears or... Anyway, so my collection. Uh, this, this particular collection is brushes. And this is a, hang, a clothing hanger that is a brush. Now, painting will never be the same when you paint with a brush like this, right? And besides being a, a wonderful object. Uh, painting with a shoe. <laughs> now, right? <laughs> So the first thing is put away those dreadful school brushes, you know, and, and rediscover brushing, rediscover drawing as if you were drawing. Always think of as you're drawing for the first time, as you're using your material for the first time, discover it. I was fired, and I'm very proud to say that, from Crayola. I was, I was going around the country with the Crayola Dream Makers thing, and when Crayola heard that it was these supplies... <laughs> There are kids' real art supplies and not necessarily Crayola, which they package. They got very upset at me. But um, the, the traditional tools are, are uh, enhanced by all these things. Look at this wonderful brush. And you can imagine painting with them, or you can actually use some of these. Some of them are antique, so, but there are many that you can actually paint with. Um, this is a very different painting with uh, a brush like this or, or a, um, this is a vice water from the 1930s. Now, I, I don't uh, recommend painting with it. It's quite an antique. But there are fly, modern fly waters of all kinds, which are just wonderful paintbrushes. <laughs> uh, the notion that art has not been invented yet is what I'm talking about. Too many kids, what did you learn today? Oh, I learned Jackson Pollock. Or I learned, no, art has not been invented yet. It's, it's still up to you to invent art, to find art. And you want them to feel when they walk out of your class that the world is open, that they can paint with anything, and really anything. And they can paint on anything, on any surface. <laughs> so, it's important to leave the kids from the room as really artists of the 21st uh, century where the art world is open to them. That their pajamas, their notebooks, their every, every surface in the world is already designed for them. What voice do they still have? So you need to really look back as what changes they can still make. I'm working now in a middle school book, and it's certainly then the middle schools a very important question when kids want to have a voice, want to say something, want to become adults, want to have this, well, how are you going to do it? Art is contributing to the world in middle school, and how are you going to make that contribution? It's not going to be through shading and, and uh, gesture drawing or the Bauhaus, which is mainly our art curriculum now, the uh, perspective drawing, all those things come from the 1940s. So how are these kids are going to make a contribution to the world? So it's empowering kids. It's, it's really leaving the kids with the notion that they are artists, that art is not an open and closed subject, that it has not been made and created for them, that they're the ones who are doing it right now. And you as the art teacher are their biggest fans. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I'll be very happy to talk to each and every one of you. I'm on the website at the University of Kentucky. If you like to, we do all of what I'm talking about in the public schools with children, as was mentioned before. And if you like to come and visit and see what we do in the schools, I teach middle and elementary with my students. We go into the schools. We take uh, about 250 children each semester. You can come. I'll help you with accommodations and see what we do. If you're interested, please just get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you.